To this point, we've seen that Jesus is best understood as a Jewish apocalyptic prophet who predicted that the end of this evil age was imminent, that God would soon send a cosmic judge from heaven called the Son of Man who would destroy the forces aligned against God and bring in his kingdom. This point of view is expressly found in our earliest traditions, many of which attested independently of one another. Some of these traditions pass the criterion of dissimilarity, and all of them are contextually credible. As we saw in the last lecture, the apocalyptic thrust of Jesus' message puts a new light on the nature of his ethical teachings. In this lecture, we'll explore further some of the other familiar words of Jesus, at least those that can be established as historically authentic, and try to situate them within their own historical context. Many people today consider Jesus to be one of the greatest ethical teachers of all time, with his stress on the law to love your neighbor as yourself, and his formulation of the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This stress on Jesus as an ethical teacher is, of course, true. Jesus did teach ethics, and many of his ethical teachings have come down to us today as, uh, as perfect examples of how people ought to live. But it's important for us to understand that the meaning of Jesus' ethical teachings may have been quite different in his own context from their meaning in ours. In our context, ethical teachings assist us in knowing how to get along with one another so that we can build a more healthy and wholesome society, allowing us to have peace and prosperity over the long haul. But as we've seen, for Jesus, there was not going to be a long haul. The Son of Man was soon to come in judgment, and people needed to prepare for his coming by acting in ways that show they showed they sided with God rather than with the forces of evil that were opposed to him. Jesus' ethical teachings, in other words, were ethics of the coming kingdom. They both reflected what life would be like in the kingdom and qualified a person to enter into it once it arrived. In the kingdom, there would be no hatred, so people should love one another now. In the kingdom, there would be no oppression, so people ought to work for justice now. In the kingdom, there would be no war, so people should work for peace now. In the kingdom, there would be no sexism, so people should work for equality now. Only those who lived in ways that are appropriate to the kingdom would be allowed to enter into it when it arrived. It would be a mistake to think that these ethical teachings of Jesus could be understood apart from considering them in relationship to the Jewish law. For, in fact, as we've seen before, Jesus himself was fully Jewish in every way, and he embraced the Jewish law and saw himself as a principal proponent and interpreter of that law. This is a point that I have to stress with my students, uh, especially my undergraduate students, time and again, that Jesus has to be understood as himself being thoroughly Jewish. Among other things, this means that Jesus presupposed in all of his teachings ideas that were central to Judaism at his time, that virtually every Jew in his world subscribed to. Most Jew, every Jew that we know about from that world, subscribed to three major ideas that, that put them over against the, uh, the pagans of their environment in the Greco-Roman world. First, Jews, unlike their pagan neighbors, were monotheistic. They believed in only one God, who was the creator of all things. Uh, everybody else, of course, was a polytheist, believing in many gods. Jesus, naturally, presupposes the existence of one God, and since his ministry is almost entirely uh, dealing with Jews, he doesn't go to any great lengths to try and prove that there's only one God or to try and exposit on the nature of the oneness of God. He simply assumes that there's only one God, as did uh, the other Jews that he's speaking with. Second, Jews in that environment believed that God 
the one God, the creator of all, had made a covenant with his people Israel, had made an agreement or a treaty or a pact with the people of Israel to be their God so long as they would be his people. This covenant that God had made with people, the people of Israel goes all the way back to the time of the Jewish ancestors. God made a covenant with Abraham that his descendants would be the people of God. He made a covenant with Moses that involved choosing the people and saving them from their slavery in exchange for them keeping his commandments. The third aspect of Judaism then that Jesus presupposes that uh, other Jews subscribe to was this idea of the law. The law of God was given by God to Moses to instruct his people both how to worship him and how to live in community together. Jews accepted the idea that God's law had give, been given to them as the covenant people of God, and Jesus accepted the law as well. As we'll see, it would be a completely false idea to think of Jesus as somebody who was opposed to the law of Moses or who tried to set up a new religion that was against the law. Jesus didn't understand himself as an opponent of the law. On the contrary, Jesus understood himself as, the, as an interpreter of the law. To be Jewish in Jesus' day meant, in part, to embrace the law that God was believed to have given to Moses as this law was embodied in the first five books of what we think of as the Hebrew Bible, the Torah, five books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. These five books, of course, were in existence in Jesus' day, and these five books were seen as scriptural authority by virtually all Jews that we know about. Jesus himself appealed to this law and interpreted it throughout his teachings. The idea that Jesus understood himself as an interpreter of the law and saw the law as important for Jewish life and for what we might think of as ethics is attested throughout many of our traditions. In other words, the idea of Jesus as an interpreter of the law is independently attested. One of the most interesting uh, passages found in the Gospels with respect to Jesus and the law is found in our earliest account, the Gospel of Mark, in chapter 10. This is a, uh, a story that uh, I think probably passes our various criteria, probably in some sense goes back to Jesus. It's an account in, John chap in Mark chapter 10 where uh, a man comes up to Jesus, kneels before him, and asks Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. So Jesus, the, the man wants to know, how do I have eternal life? Uh, how do I enter the kingdom that's coming? Jesus tells him, keep the commandments. Uh, the person then responds to him by saying, Teacher, I've kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the man heard this, he was shocked and went away grieved, for he had many possessions. Uh, then right after this is where Jesus starts telling his disciples that uh, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because to enter the kingdom of heaven, you have to give up everything for the sake of this coming kingdom. I th I'm not sure that this entire story, as it's framed in Mark, goes back to Jesus. In other words, I don't, I'm not sure that if you had a video camera, you would have been able to capture this on tape. I do think that the basic idea of the story, the kernel of the story, probably is historical, though, because it seems to me to pass the criterion of dissimilarity. Christians would probably not have made up a story that said, if you want to have eternal life, all you have to do is keep the commandments. And then, uh, you know, on top of the commandments, simply give away all your possessions. Why? Because Christians thought the only way to have eternal life was to believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus. There's nothing about belief here. They're simply following the commandments, giving away your possessions, then you'll have treasures in heaven. Well, if Christians wouldn't have made up the story, why is it in the tradition? Probably this is a story that goes back to Jesus. It portrays Jesus as somebody who is firmly committed to the law of Moses. What must you do to have eternal life? You keep the commandments. 
This teaching of Jesus is consonant with other teachings throughout the Gospels. Jesus constantly refers to the law in order to tell people how they ought to behave and in order to explain uh, both the will of God and his own activities. We find these teachings in Mark, as we've just seen. We find them in Q. We find them in M. We find them in John. Matthew's Gospel, preserving a tradition in what we call M, uh, has Jesus say that, in fact, a person must keep the commandments of God found in the Torah better than the scribes and the Pharisees if they want to enter into the kingdom. Jesus says, don't think that I came to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. Not one jot or tittle will pass from the law until all is fulfilled. Moreover, your righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. Throughout the Gospels of the New Testament, Jesus constantly quotes the law and gives his own interpretation of it over against the interpretations of other teachers of his day. The disputes Jesus had with the Pharisees, Sadducees, and others, as we'll see more fully in the next lecture, were not disputes over whether somebody should be Jewish or whether somebody should keep the law or whether the law came from God. The disputes were about the interpretations of the law. Just as within Pharisaism, different rabbis disputed this commandment, what it meant here, what it meant there, how one should understand the law, so too Jesus entered into disputes with other Jewish teachers about legal interpretation. In contrast to Pharisees, as we'll see more fully next time, Jesus did not think that scrupulous observance of every single detail of every law was what God was ultimately concerned about. Jesus didn't think that a person should actually break the law. In fact, as we're going to see, and to the surprise of many people, in fact, there's very little evidence that Jesus himself ever did break the law, let alone that he wanted anybody else to, to break it. Uh, it's not that Jesus thought you should break the law, but Jesus appeared to think that it's possible to keep the law, technically speaking, without really doing what God wants. And Jesus tried to show then what it was that was that God really wanted. In contrast to the Sadducees, Jesus evidently did not think that carefully adhering to the laws of how to sacrifice in the temple would bring a person into a right standing before God. In contrast to the Essenes, Jesus did not, did not think that maintaining one's own ritual purity by separating oneself from the sinfulness of the rest of the world was ultimately what God wanted. In all of these disagreements, the issue was never over whether God's law, as found in the Hebrew Bible, should be kept. The question was how it should be kept and what it meant to keep it. For Jesus, as for other Jewish teachers of his day that we know about because we have other sayings of other teachers preserved, what ultimately mattered uh, was that the people of God keep the very heart of God's law, namely the commandments that one should love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your strength, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, and that one should love one's neighbor as oneself, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. According to an ancient tradition found in Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter uh, 12, verses 28 through 34, when a legal scholar came up to Jesus and said, what are the, what's the greatest commandment? These are the two commandments that, that Jesus gave. Love God above all else. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus did not invent the saying that you should love your neighbor as yourself. When he gives that teaching, he's simply quoting Scripture itself. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Jesus then, like other Jewish teachers of his day, saw the love commandments as standing at the heart of the law. If somebody really does that, really loves God above all else, and really loves one's neighbor, then one will be fulfilling what God wants. For Jesus, the way one loves God above all else is by committing oneself completely to him, rather than living for oneself. And the way one loves one's neighbor as oneself is by becoming a servant of others rather than seeking to exalt oneself over them. Doing these things for Jesus, a person would fulfill the law of God. 
even though the commandment to love, to love God, to love one's neighbor, even though the commandment to love is simple, for Jesus it is also all-encompassing. Giving oneself over completely to the command to love is, complete, is necessary if one wants to enter into God's kingdom, which for Jesus is the ultimate goal of all human existence. The kingdom of God, according to Jesus, is to be sought after as one's most prized possession. One, in fact, should give up everything one has for the sake of this coming kingdom. There's this very interesting parable in Matthew chapter 13, uh, which has a uh, uh, parallel in the Gospel of Thomas, the so-called parable of the pearl of great price. Very brief little parable that's intriguing. Jesus says that the kingdom of God is like a merchant who is in search of, of pearls, and he finds, finally, a great pearl, uh, a perfect pearl. In order to own the pearl, then, the merchant sells everything he has, and with the proceeds, he buys the pearl. It's the end of the story. It's a strange story, though, when you think about it. This person gives up everything he has, sells the entirety of all he has to buy the pearl. But then what does he have? Well, he's got the pearl, but he's got nothing else. And what good is that? Presumably, having a pearl is of some use if you uh, maybe can sell it to buy other things, or if you can display it, or if you could do something. You can't do anything. It's just a pearl. That's all he's got, but he sold everything for it. Sometimes Jesus' parables are meant to be ridiculous like that, or to sound odd or paradoxical, or to make you kind of sit up and think, what in the world? But for Jesus, that's exactly right. The kingdom of God is like that. It might seem absurd, but you give up everything for it. That's how valuable it is. Nothing in human existence should be of any ultimate concern except for this coming kingdom. As Jesus says in uh, Matthew's version of the sermon, the, the sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, uh, verse 25, not even what you eat or what you wear should be of any importance to you. Don't worry about your life, what you eat or what you drink, or about your body, what you wear. Is life not worth more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow nor reap nor gather into barns, but your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? And can you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? Why do you worry about clothing? Look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God has cl so clothed the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the, the, uh, into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Then he goes on to say, Strive above all for the kingdom of God and, is, and his righteousness, and all these other things will be given to you. What is of ultimate importance is not what you eat, drink, or wear. What's of ultimate importance is this coming kingdom. You should abandon everything for it. Abandoning everything for it means com be being completely committed to God. A person cannot be committed to more than one master. As uh, Jesus says in Luke chapter 16, you can't serve two masters. If you do, you'll despise the one and love the other. You can only serve one master, and therefore you should serve God alone. Or as the same saying is said in the Gospel of Thomas, I rather like this way of putting it. Jesus, This is independent of Luke. Uh, Jesus says, it's impossible for a person to mount two horses or to stretch at the same time two bows. And it's impossible for a servant to serve two masters. Otherwise, he'll honor the one and serve the other contemptuously. One should then give up everything, all possessions and everything that binds one to this world in light of this coming kingdom. One should serve God alone in anticipation then that he'll give this kingdom. Those who give up their lives will gain much in the kingdom that is soon to appear. In one story in Mark's gospel, we have the account of uh, Jesus saying, you have to give up everything. And Peter saying, uh, well, look, uh, we've left our homes and our families and our fields, our houses to follow you. And uh, Jesus replies, yes, everyone who has given up 
uh, everything to follow me in this age will gain uh, more fields, more houses, more family, and in the age to come will gain eternal life. Following Jesus to enter into the kingdom means giving up everything. Once one does, one will gain more now and one will gain eternal life then. This business of leaving one's family in order to follow Jesus bring up another point. As odd as it might seem to us today, Jesus' emphasis on giving up everything for the kingdom probably means that Jesus was not a major proponent of what people today call family values. In fact, Jesus was quite unambiguous that parents, siblings, spouses, and even children were to be of no importance in comparison with this coming kingdom. As he says in both Luke and the Gospel of Thomas, a person must hate his father and mother if they're to be his disciple. Hate father and mother? Well, in comparison with the coming kingdom, father, mother, siblings, spouse, children are to be of no importance. Jesus himself appears to have realized how divisive this teaching could be, but he evidently claimed that he came not in order to keep families together, but to split them up. Don't think that I came to bring peace. I've come to cast a sword on the earth. Families will be divided against one another. A, fa a father against the son, a son against the father, a mother against the daughter, a daughter against the mother, and so forth. Jesus' teachings are going to split families rather than bring them together. As with the other hard sayings of Jesus, I don't think that these should be explained away so that they no longer mean what they say. Instead, they should be placed within their own apocalyptic context. For Jesus, the kingdom was so important and so near that people should abandon everything, even their own families and their own family commitments if necessary, in order to prepare for its arrival. This raises a related question about what Jesus taught about marriage. It's an interesting question to think what did Jesus think about uh, whether uh, about men and women being married together because there's no indication that Jesus himself was married, which would be uh, highly unusual for a Jewish man in the first century. Now, in today's culture, if, uh, if a... Uh, if a middle-aged man is not married, a common assumption is often, well, he's gay. In the ancient society, uh, that wasn't the assumption at all. In the ancient society of Jesus' day, if a, a middle-aged man wasn't married, the assumption was he's ascetic. He's depriving himself of the pleasures of the flesh. There is good evidence that Jesus, in fact, was ascetic. As we've just seen, he teaches that you shouldn't be concerned about what you eat, what you drink, what you wear. Did Jesus think that you shouldn't be married? Jesus, of course, never teaches against marriage, but it is there, there are some suggestions about what Jesus thought about marriage, especially in a passage found in our earliest source, Mark, in one of Jesus' conflicts with, uh, in this case, not the Pharisees, but with the Sadducees. The Sadducees, uh, as we've seen, were a group that subscribed principally to the teachings of the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, the Torah. The Sadducees, among other things, did not think there was going to be a future resurrection of the dead. They, uh, they come up to Jesus in Mark chapter 12 and ask, ask him why he thinks there's going to be a future resurrection, and they, uh, they kind of set a trap for him. They say... Uh, a hypothetical situation. There's a man who's married and uh, he and his wife don't have any children. The man dies. Now according to the law of Moses, if a man dies without leaving his spouse any children and his, he's got a single brother, his brother's supposed to marry the, marry the woman. Well it turns out there were seven brothers and the first one to marry the woman, they had no children, he dies. The second one marries her, uh, no children, he dies. Third marries, no children. All seven of them end up marrying this woman, they all die. Uh, and then the woman dies. And they say, now, when everybody's raised from the dead, whose wife is she going to be? Well, it's a tricky, tricky question. But Jesus deals with the question because he believes there is going to be a future resurrection, as a good apocalypticist would believe. His reply, though, is that you don't know the scriptures nor the power of God, because in the resurrection, 
There will not be marriage nor giving in marriage. People won't be married. They'll be like, he says, the angels. Jesus appears to have believed that in the new age that's coming, there would not be marital relationships. Elsewhere, we've seen that Jesus believed his followers should begin implementing the ideals of the kingdom in the present, now. It may well be that Jesus urged his followers not only to leave their spouses, but not to get married if they could help it. That is exactly the teaching of one of his followers, the Apostle Paul, in 1 Corinthians, some 30, 25 years later, when Paul urges the Christians, if they could help it, not to get married because the end was near and there's no point being married in the present age. Jesus appears not to have advocated what we today might think of as strong family values because he wasn't interested in a strong social structure to promote a healthy society, precisely because he thought society was diseased and was soon going to be destroyed. One needed to be ready for the new order, in which there'd be no marriage, no children, where everyone would be brothers and sisters of one another, and all people would be children of the one true God. Jesus appears to have maximalized the commandment to love one another and to minimize everything else in comparison. We can see this throughout Jesus' various teachings. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus delivers what are uh, the statements that are called the antitheses, in which he will set up a teaching of the law and then set over against it his interpretation of the law. Uh, which show his maximalization of the teaching of love. The law says don't, mur don't murder. Jesus says, if you really want to love your neighbor, you won't only not murder your neighbor, you won't even be angry with your neighbor. The law says, don't take your neighbor's wife. Don't commit adultery. Well, if you really engage in love, though, you won't even not take your neighbor's wife. You won't even want to take your neighbor's wife. You won't even lust after her. The law says that you should make the punishment of someone who has offended you commensurate with the offense. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But if you really love your neighbor, you won't demand a punishment at all or even take offense when he harms you. So if somebody hurts you, you should turn the other cheek. This love of others should extend to everyone in the most extreme circumstances. You shouldn't seek restitution for what others have taken from you. Instead, you should forgive what others owe you. You shouldn't judge others for their genuine shortcomings. You should judge not, lest you be judged. You should love those even who are your own sworn enemies, who are out to hurt and kill you. In particular, Jesus was concerned that his followers engaged in act of love for those who are underprivileged and oppressed, the impoverished, the mentally diseased, the terminally ill, the outcast, the imprisoned. It was such as these, according to Jesus, who would inherit the kingdom of heaven when it arrived. The command to love one's neighbor as oneself, of course, had its corollary in the command to love God above all else. This love of God meant anticipating his coming kingdom and putting its kingdom above everything. People could trust that God would give them this good kingdom because God was like a good parent a father who loved his children who would give them what they needed. That's why people could ask God for whatever they needed and God would provide it for them. This trust of God to give them what they needed as a good parent is, of course, Jesus' teaching about faith. Faith in God means trusting God as you trust a good parent to give you what you need, especially this good kingdom that was coming. In conclusion, the more clearly ethical teachings of Jesus are not to be removed from their apocalyptic context. It's true that Jesus delivered some of the great ethical instructions that have ever been heard in the history of our form of civilization. But these instructions were not meant to make us better people so that we could lead long and productive lives in a harmonious society. They were instead meant to prepare people for the coming kingdom where love would reign supreme and there would be no more hatred, oppression, or abuse. Jesus gave these, interpretation, these teachings as interpretations of the Jewish law. They were ultimately based on two of the commandments of the law that Jesus saw as encompassing all others, the commandment to love God completely and the commandment to love one's neighbor as oneself. 
Jesus, in other words, did not see himself as inventing a new system of ethics, but as explaining the law of Moses in view of his, of his own apocalyptic context. Those who committed themselves completely to God and their fellow humans in love would survive the coming onslaught when the Son of Man arrived from heaven in judgment against all those who stood opposed to God and his ways.